content. And most importantly, we also want to acknowledge that although we aren't meeting together, many, if not all of us here today, are on Indigenous land, the land on which the JHI and the U University of Toronto operates, which is close to where I'm located at the moment, is the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place in Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and although we're meeting together digitally, we're grateful to work and convene together on this Indigenous land. So as you all know, this panel will focus on the upcoming election in the United States. And we're going to be thinking about what that election means for us as Canadians, North Americans, and global citizens. We are going to be asking our panelists a variety of questions. Some questions Melissa and I have developed, some we've drawn from the questions you submitted ahead of time. Periodically, we're going to be asking some poll questions. So keep an eye out for a poll question popping up on your screen and you can answer those so we can check in with the audience about what your thoughts are on some of these issues. We also want to note that live captioning is available for this event and that the broadcast is being recorded and it will be available with captions and a transcript on the JHI's YouTube page. All right, so now I'd like to introduce our four panelists who have graciously given us their time today to share their insights. Jason Opel is an associate professor and chair of the history department at McGill University. He studies and teaches classes on the American Revolution and the early decades of the United States. Uh, Regina Bateson is a political scientist who is a visiting professor at the University of Ottawa. In 2017 to 2018, she ran for Congress in California's 4th District. Regina was also previously a Foreign Service Officer for the U.S. Department of State. Jamie Lee Kurtz is a postdoctoral fellow at the Digital Democracies Institute at Simon Fraser University. She specializes in algorithms, gender studies, and the role of communication in democracy. And last but certainly not least, Wendell Nilayi Ajite is Assistant Professor of Post-Reconstruction U.S. at McGill University. He specializes in African American history and the history of African diaspora in Canada and the Caribbean. Okay, so welcome panel. And we are going to start off with a quick question for all of you. What will be most pressing on your mind on election night? What will you be looking out for? And Jason, can we start with you, please? Uh, certainly, yes. So I would say the thing I'll be looking out for uh, most uh, in a short term sense would be uh, election uh, data returns from usually ignored states like New Hampshire and Maine that might hold secrets or, or indications as to how this election will go uh, in comparison to the 2016 election and the well-known discrepancies between the polls and the results. More broadly, I'll be thinking about um, the number 59. There have been 58 relatively peaceful, relatively orderly, and dare I say relatively democratic transfers of power between presidents in US history. This would be the 59th. And it is, uh, or but it is um, the one, or certainly one of the, of the few, where I think um, that sequence or that um, record of unbroken uh, peaceful transfers of power is in uh, danger of being broken. I should say on a personal note, I will also be somewhat concerned for relatives that I have in the United States, uh, my home country. And I'll be thinking, I guess, therefore, at kind of two levels. One, the kind of um, wonky uh, uh, um, voting results level, and one at a, at a sort of larger historical level, wondering where 2020 will, will land. All right, thanks so much, Jason. And Regina, we'd love to hear from you. All right, thanks so much. So I think in normal circumstances, um, of course, the thing I'd be focusing on would be the key swing states, the early voting return numbers, um, turnout, 
uh, is also, I think, an indicator even on the day of the election. Um, but this year is quite different in a couple ways. I mean, so first of all, there's so much early voting happening um, that to me, it feels like the fundamentals of the race are already set in motion. Um, you know, that is that we already know some key things about um, how the debates went. You know, we know that public opinion has actually been very steady on some key issues. Um, right now, more than 70% of Americans are at least uh, somewhat or very concerned that they or a loved one might get COVID-19. Uh, that's been a very steady number over time. Um, a majority of Americans also distrust Donald Trump's handling of the pandemic. Um, and on other issue areas, public opinion has been quite steady um, and generally against Trump. Um, so on election night, the thing I'm really actually going to be looking at is probably social media, because I think where there is more uncertainty in this election, on election night in particular, um, is not so much in these fundamentals of the race. It's really, uh, how does this go down? <laughs> how does it play out? Um, and how are the results communicated? How long does it take for them to be tabulated? It would be totally normal for a lot of mail ballots to take some amount of time to be counted. Um, so what happens in that interim? And so on election night, uh, to my mind, there are three possible scenarios. Uh, scenario one is a Biden blowout. Um, I think a Trump blowout is basically impossible. Um, a Trump victory is possible, but not uh, sort of an overwhelming landslide at this point. Um, Biden landslide is possible, uh, not guaranteed, but um, if a number of things all broke the same way, um, it could be quite clear quite fast uh, that Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris are the probable winners. Another scenario is kind of the mushy middle. So things are unclear, vote counting is taking a while, um, and that has the potential um, to spiral in a number of bad directions, uh, particularly given you know, the amount of misinformation that could be circulating um, and given Trump's unpredictable behavior uh, and you know, the behavior of a number of other act of actors. Um, a third scenario, which I personally would like to see, although I think is unlikely, uh, is a social media blackout. Um, it is theoretically possible that social media companies could coordinate and could have done this and not told the public yet um, and could decide to simply shut themselves down for 24 hours or for 48 hours and in that time redirect people to credible news sources um, from across the ideological spectrum. And we know that um, social media, in particular Facebook, um, Twitter, other platforms have played a key role in political violence already in this election cycle um, and in the spread of misinformation. And we also know that these companies have a poor record um, of being able to respond in real time to um, the sharing of misinformation and the fomenting of violence. So I think it could be prudent for them to say, hey, uh, we care more about democracy than about our bottom line. We are willing to shut ourselves down for 24 hours, 48 hours, um, allow the dust to settle, allow people to get their information from credible sources, places that have editors, <laughs> and that vet information before sharing it with the public, um, and then we'll go live again. You know, do I think that's going to happen? No, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but it is possible, and it's something that I would like to see on election night. Great. Thanks, Regina. And that segues nicely to Jamie Lee. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to just acknowledge that as part of SFU, um, I live and we work on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, and the um, Salawafi uh, nations. So what I'm going to be looking for is less about the results of the election and more about the interactions within communities and between communities and platforms and media. So I'm going to be looking for how people are responding to information that they're receiving in terms of either accepting or uh, disagreeing with the types of uh, information or uh, disrupting the types of information that is being received by them and more so how they're expressing that. Um, I'm interested to see not in just them saying that's false or that's fake, but how they are coming to that conclusion, how they're expressing it, what types of justifications that they're using. I'm also gonna be interested in terms of what kind of moderate, moderation efforts that the different platforms are going to take. Uh, moderation efforts can reveal a lot about how a tech company uh, understands the rhetoric and the language of a community, as well as how they prioritize different kinds of communities and different kinds of speech. 
And lastly, I'll be looking at the movement of conversations across platforms. I think that's something we often forget to talk about is the cross-platform pollination of information. And so I think that's a really important area to be looking at how conversations and information is circulated and flowing. And lastly, on a personal note, I'll be messaging and checking in with all of my friends. I did my PhD in Colorado and only moved back to Canada last year. So I still have a lot of ties in the States. So I'll be checking in and making sure that my friend's mental health <laughs> is okay. Great. Thanks, Jamie Lee. Wendell, what do you think? So on election night, I'll be anticipating two dominating narratives. Uh, the first is a triumphalist, uh, redemptive narrative. And then the other is a narrative rooted in incredulity and condemnation. Um, in terms of the latter narrative, uh, I presume that the corporate media, the uh, Democratic Party establishment, uh, surrogates, uh, political um, pundits, as well as stakeholders the world over. Um, if Donald Trump does pull off an upset victory, I presume that there will be a heightened rhetoric in terms of the impending doom of the Republic, as well as uh, the unraveling of uh, liberal institutions and US democracy as we know it. Um, and certainly, I, I presume there will be also an element of scapegoating if somehow uh, this person is able to pull off a, an upset victory. And the scapegoating will likely be uh, targeted at uh, Black men who might have voted for Donald Trump, even though empirically uh, it holds no water. There is no statistical um, assessment that says Black men could uh, act as swing voters and sort of aid uh, Donald Trump in a, a potential uh, presidential victory. Conversely, and on the other hand, if Biden-Harris uh, ticket prevails, um, and they're very much, uh, I guess, favorites to win, I presume that there will be uh, an underscoring of this triumphalist redemptive narrative that the Republic has been saved, American democracy has been restored, uh, liberal institutions will be saved as well. Um, and of course, there will be uh, an element of uh, political pandering in terms of the rhetoric that um, uh, Black women have saved the Democratic Party um, and that they have played the pivotal role. And so clearly, there is an element of uh, pitting uh, black male voters versus um, black women voters. It's something that has been uh, ongoing in the Democratic Party establishment in the post-war period. Uh, and of course, I presume in the wake of a Biden-Harris uh, victory, there will be very little talk coming out of the uh, corporate media, out of uh, the Democratic establishment, pundits, surrogates, um, stakeholders as well, that we do have a president-elect and a VP-elect who made their careers off warehousing Black men, warehousing surplus labor in the United States, to borrow the phrase of Karl Marx. And I'm not a Marxist, but it is very constructive in terms of understanding where we are in the United States. Um, and so these are the two prevailing narratives, and I am waiting in anticipation to see how uh, both the left and the right and also the center uh, can reconcile these uncomfortable truths about quote-unquote American democracy and American quote-unquote liberalism. So uh, Wendell and Jason and Wendell you mentioned you know the post-war period and uh, there is a, one word we often hear is this unprecedented, that this is an unprecedented election. And so I want to turn to you both, Wendell and Jason, as historians right now. And Jason, maybe we can start with you to, to understand where we might find some history that can shed some light on this moment uh, and what might prove relevant for us to understand what's going on right now. So Jason, you study and think about the founders, the Constitution, the early years of the United States when the U.S. was forming. What history feels relevant for you right now in these final days before the election? Um, it's an excellent question. I think I would 
I would say two things. Um, the first, and somewhat uh, building off um, Professor Ajeti's comments, um, there's this bit powerful narrative that you know Donald Trump is an aberration from American norms and constitutional norms. And there's a, there's a lot to say about that. There's a lot to, to, of truth to that. Um, James Madison uh, famously and explicitly said that the big worry would be a president who uses the power of the office to stay in office. And he's come to seem quite prescient. However, the Constitution, although it sets up a very uh, uh, durable rule of law, did not necessarily set up or does not necessarily allow for a very democratic rule of law. It has powerful anti-majoritarian elements in it, which Mr. Trump um, is a dark reflection of rather than a aberration from. Um, so you think about the Electoral College, you think about the Senate, originally designed not to be popularly elected at all. And of course, you think about the courts. Um, but having said all that, I think that to me, the, the history that feels, or sorry, the presidential election that feels strangely relevant here is 1876 ra rather than uh, a contested election, say in 1800 or 1824. In 1876, 1877, there were in fact dueling electoral groups from various contested states. Um, again, a kind of contested election more broadly. And the way that election was settled, and this is a, one of these elections where you put the asterisk upon the 58 uh, uh, unbroken peaceful elections, was to essentially pull federal troops out of the United States South of the defeated Confederate States and allow for, if I may, a highly effective terrorist uh, operation to restore um, the entirety of white supremacy in the South uh, in the former Confederate States. So the Republic was saved at the expense of uh, approximately 4.5 million people in, in the American South uh, predominantly. So, what I what I find um, discouragingly or, or or painfully relevant there is that there is a genuine possibility of a disputed election in which there are multiple and rival delegates from various states, probably the the usual suspects like Florida and Pennsylvania. That is a real possibility, and I cannot imagine or think of a precedent that would enable us to or a useful past that would enable us to get past, to get through that. Um, and in that respect, I really do see this election as unprecedented. And if I may build off uh, Professor Opal's uh, insightful commentary, um, indeed, when we misconstrue Donald Trump's presidency as an aberration, um, we are liable to engage in ahistorical uh, arguments, um, bad faith arguments, um, and also just committing uh, sort of a, an egregious um, error in terms of understanding the complexities of US history and the complexities of US society and the many, many, many fault lines in what we call US democracy. Certainly there's a, a modicum of democracy in the United States, but for whom? at every generation, for whom, right? And so uh, in thinking of this particular moment, whether it's, on pre whether it's without precedent, um, I am reminded of uh, the election of 72, 1972, uh, with uh, Nixon and uh, McGovern. And in 72, um, students at the University of Toronto, both white and black, uh, got together to lobby the Canadian federal government um, and to lobby specifically the Minister of Immigration because they wanted uh, a certain American citizen to cross the border who was unable to cross the border legally at the time. And this was Bobby Seal. So black and white students at the University of Toronto lobbied and successfully were able to get Seal uh, to visit the campus and to deliver a rousing speech. Um, and he effectively said that four more years four more years of a Nixon uh, presidency uh, would further entrench this militarism, this post-war militarism in the United States, that fascism, and again, these aren't my words, these are Seal's words, that fascism uh, was on the rise and that we cannot extricate ourselves from this fascist order or proto-fascist order in the United States. 
when we consider these past sort of watershed historical moments, it becomes that much harder to see Donald Trump in his sort of spectacular buffoonery and performative nonsensical behavior. It becomes that much harder to see Donald Trump as this boogeyman, as this perennial, unprecedented bad actor, right? And that's frankly not the case. And uh, even going back a, a century, right, we can go back into from 1870, uh, in the 1870s, and Professor Opal um, alluded to the uh, contested election of 1876. What effectively happens when the military dictatorship, literally during Reconstruction, it required a military dictatorship to keep white supremacists at bay from terrorizing black people, even though they still managed to terrorize black people in some parts of the Confederacy, right? And so to understand that particular moment and what happened and what black families and black communities endured in terms of these organized pogroms or organized ethnic cleansing campaigns, Donald Trump does not really, in that light, seem as much of a boogeyman, considering what has happened before. And even a century before 1876, the contested election of 1876, when we look at the spirit of 1776, you had black men and women and children fighting in auxiliary capacities to support the revolutionaries was liberty and freedom promised to them? No. Was security of person promised to them? No. Was a semblance of human dignity promised to them? No. They were still chattel, and they would be chattel until the US Civil War. And going back a century before that, in 17 or 1676, with Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion, the first time truly on this North American mainland where Black, discontented Black and white males and persons were able to work together in a common cause in the resistance of the ruling class. And what happened after 1676, immediately various colonial laws came into place to further entrench the system of racial caste that would forever codify the sub subordination and subjugation of black peoples and the empowerment of white peoples. And so when we understand the context of the 2020 election and the long durée of US history, but also US uh, colonial history, it's not an aberration at all, in fact. Well, and, and Wendell, if you, I wanted to ask you as well, you mentioned you know, the election of 1972. I think another, some things I have heard people in popular press and the culture mention uh, the U.S. is on the verge of civil war. That's something we've heard, that the, it hasn't been this uh, divided since the 1850s. You mentioned the election of 1972. I think people, I've also heard people point to the 1960s in terms of waves of protest, uh, civil unrest. Do you see uh, parallels that we can draw between the 1960s as well as today and this sort of uh, your point as well as Jason Opel's point that this isn't an action, an aberration at all. Uh, excellent question, uh, Melissa. And indeed, uh, the 70s and 60s, lest we forget, lest we forget, the U.S. federal government was engaged in a no-holds-bar persecution assassination, and outright decapitation of Black power and the African-American freedom struggle in the 60s and early 70s, right? This was under the guise of COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program. It is very difficult then to argue that somehow American democracy is at risk because of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is unequivocally a product of a very corrosive system and toxic system, especially where Black peoples are concerned, where African Americans are concerned. And if I may add very quickly, in the context of the 72 election, and sort of in the wake of uh, the freedom struggle in the 1960s in particular, there were Democrats who despised McGovern, George McGovern, for his very progressive stance, his anti-war stance, his dovish stance. And in many ways, that helped 
galvanize support for Nixon, who had no qualms about engaging in very sort of totalitarian, dictatorial, proto-fascist um, forms of governance. And so when we, um, when we consider what was happening in the 60s and 70s and what Black people um, from uh, Black Panthers to uh, various members of uh, the Black freedom struggle uh, were uh, speaking against, um, it's, it's crystal clear. And if I may uh, just reference very quickly, um, something that was uh, stated uh, in 1964, um, and I quote, we suffer political oppression, economic exploitation, and social degradation. The government has failed us. You cannot deny that. These aren't my words. These are the words of Malcolm X in his um, famous Valerie the Bullet speech. I think Regina, you wanted to just br briefly offer a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in quickly and say I really appreciated your comments, Wendell. And um, it actually makes me think of um, a concept that we sometimes use to talk about democracy in Latin America, which is the region that I mostly um, do my research about, uh, which is the idea of disjunctive democracy. And so, um, like this actually comes from scholars who've worked on Brazil primarily, um, uh, such as James Holston, Teresa Caldeira, um, anthropologists. But the idea of disjunctive democracy is that you have an electoral democracy and at the same time, persistent violations of civil rights. And um, I actually think that's quite consistent um, with some of the things that have happened in US history and in fact are continuing to happen. And so then what you see um, in these disjunctive democracies is uh, potentially very high levels of electoral participation, um, but at the same time, um, very loud claims for rights and continuing claims for rights. And so I think, um, you know, one of the points Wendell was getting at, which is that even if even if Biden and Harris win and there's sort of this triumphalist narrative out there, um, the work is not done. And in fact, I don't think we should expect to see claims for rights tamped down um, after the election, even after a Biden and Harris victory. If anything, um, you know, if this idea of disjunctive democracy applies in part to the US right now, um, we might see those claims for rights get even louder. Um, which I think would be a positive thing. And I think it's unfortunate that um, those claims for rights are often reframed as conflict or as sort of divisiveness, when actually we could view it as, you know, an effort to remove the disjunctive nat nature of democracy now and, um, you know, bring our ideals in line with actual respect for people's basic civil rights. Sherry, you're muted, I think. How is that? You're okay. good now. All right, everybody. Okay, so um, Regina, I was just thanking you for your comment um, and asking you to just expand a little bit because um, we wanted to get you to talk a little bit about your interest in comparative politics. Um, Jason and Wendell have given us really fascinating and powerful observations from American history, and we are wondering if there are other places in Latin America or other examples you can think of where we can draw some insight. And I want to mention that we did get a question that drew parallels with Brexit. So feel free to comment on that or take it in any direction you like. Okay, well, thank you. I guess I jumped the gun. I was so excited by what Wendell was saying. Um, I wanted to get right in there. Um, you know, so I think that there are there are strong comparisons, um, of course, between Donald Trump and um, sort of other world leaders, especially other populists. You know, if we compare Trump to um, your typical major party nominee in the U.S., uh, or in fact sitting president, um, some aspects of his behavior recently would seem very strange. You know, why is he not talking about policy issues, even when he has, you know, sort of policy issues or accomplishments that that seem like things he would want to tout. Um, why isn't he on message with them? Um, why isn't he talking more about Amy Coney Barrett? Why isn't he, um, you know, sort of following standard political advice? And if we view him as a populist, then it all makes perfect sense all of a sudden because um, it's been very interesting. I mean, I've looked, I've written about populism um, in Latin America and especially in Central America, and 
you know, you look at the checklist of things you'd expect a populist to be doing, um, and he's basically trying them all. But the challenge for Trump is that it's, it's quite hard um, to be a populist once you're the incumbent. And this is where, in comparative cases, this is where we see um, populists attempting to win re-election as populists really struggle. Um, so once they get into office, they either need to adapt, they need to build themselves another coalition, they need to change their style, um, or they need to have really good luck or be really persuasive because they have to make some arguments that don't inherently make sense. So you see Trump working hard to paint himself as a victim, um, you know, that he's being sort of persecuted by elites and that this, this messaging comes out over and over again, even now as he is president. Um, and, you know, by definition, um, one might argue the most powerful man in the world. Um, this language, you know, populists get in trouble also um, because they usually run on the idea of draining the swamp, um, you know, of ridding the system of corruption. Then once they're in office, particularly if they themselves, um, you know, have, you know, corrupt ties or sort of become part of the swamp, it's very difficult to make that argument. Um, and I think that's why you've seen Trump turn back to trying to paint Biden as corrupt um, without really any evidence um, to support that. But I think that explains that bizarre move that he's making, trying to say, oh, no, you're the corrupt one. Um, and then the last thing is that populists, you know, operate as outsiders, right? So they're coming in from the outside, wanting to shake up the system. And this is, again, very difficult to do when you are the incumbent president. It's very hard to make that argument. And so I think that explains the uh, perhaps less than persuasive tagline that the Trump campaign seems to have settled on, which is that, you know, allegedly uh, that Joe Biden has done less in 47 years than Donald Trump has done in 47 months. I mean, that's a really, it seems like a strange tagline for a campaign, um, except, you know, if you see Trump as someone trying to still paint himself as an outsider, um, in contrast to Biden, the insider. So I think that understanding Trump's, Trump's behavior as a populist and as characteristic of populists um, around the world, it explains a lot of what's going on right now. Um, I think it also explains some of the challenges that he's run into to, um, you know, cases that I've looked at in Latin America where populists lose elections spectacularly. Um, it's often because of just glaring policy failures that can't be ignored. Um, and that's partially um, happening in the U.S. right now. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, usually when a populist has taken over a major political party and taken over the executive <laughs> branch, uh, it signals a number of other more fundamental things um, about a democracy. And those are things that are not going to go away um, in the future, even if Trump loses. Um, so we've talked about the conflict between rights um, and electoral participation in electoral democracy and that having one doesn't guarantee the other. Um, you know, but also, I mean, I think that the rise of Donald Trump reflected a real weakness of the party system in the U.S. Um, and that's probably going to continue in the future. Um, I mean, in fact, you can imagine a Trump loss um, sort of further fracturing the Republican Party um, or spawning, you know, spin-off movements, whether we call them a party or not. Um, and so I think that that fundamental weakness of the party system in the US is going to continue. Um, the deep divisions, um, you know, across both sides will continue and perhaps be exacerbated. And so I think that some of the original um, forces that gave rise to Trump won't go away. If it's all right, I just wanted to um, respond to both uh, Regina and Wendell. Uh, first to, to Wendell's point, I really enjoyed your point about colonial history. And I think that it's important to remember that colonial history is not over, but it's still ongoing. And often the ways in which it's enacted now is perhaps less obvious, but it's through technology, it's through information systems, right? It's through shaping forms of communication whether that is sending cell phones to third world countries, or even in the US itself, shaping the way that we're educating our children. All of these things act as a form of colonialism, especially in minority communities, right? Um, so I think that it's important to recognize that it is still ongoing and it just takes on a different name or a different form, but it is still very much a part of this longer uh, history of colonialism. The second point was uh, to Regina's point of populism and the kind of populist outsider uh, kind of uh, figure. It really speaks to the idea of authenticity, which is something that we often demand of our politicians, right? that they be themselves. When someone is an outsider and 
they enable a form of transgression, whether that is saying something they're not supposed to or representing something that is non-traditional. It's now seen in our day and age as authentic, as a marker of authentic, right? So rather than being something which was kind of authentic, it's the transgression of authenticity itself as a form of authenticity. And so that really speaks to how these, uh, the kind of populist uh, discourse fits into this larger picture of how, what we demand of our presidents and how, how that fits into our understandings of information and, and translation of that information and, what we de and how that um, connects to then the rhetoric and the performances of authenticity. Well, and Jamie Lee, I actually did want to turn to you unless there's any other, anyone else wants to comment. Um, I think, you know, one thing that is, this has come up already uh, is, is social media, right? And you can't talk, I think, about the 2020 election or the 2016 election for that matter without talking about fake news, disinformation, the various words that we use to call it, uh, and it's spread on social media, which seems to be something that is significant about these elections versus maybe a, a break from history when there was no such thing as Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so Jamie Lee, I was hoping that you could talk to us a bit about the different ways that you see social media and, and companies like Twitter and Facebook the different ways that they're shaping this election, because I think we can all agree that they are shaping the election. So talk to us a bit about the ways in which you sort of see that playing out. So one of the ways in which I see it playing out is this real conflation or substitution almost of truth for fact. So instead of something being a fact, it's true, right? So fake, uh, and true versus fact, not fact. And so what happens when there's this kind of conflation is there's a focus on verification. So Donald Trump may tweet something and underneath there'll be the fact check whether or not this is true. But the problem is verification alone doesn't do enough. Often these corrections reach uh, and the actual fake news stories reach different audiences. Right? Corrections can often create, uh, corrections can often create new interest in these stories. And often people share them because they're funny. It's funny to see some of the things that he comes up with. And so what happens is that we've pushed for this real focus on verification, on fact checking. Um, and in kind of their complicitly, complicitness, uh, uh, these companies are in fact conflating uh, truth um, and fact. And that's a real problem. I think going forward, because it doesn't enable us to critically engage with a lot of these uh, pieces of information and kind of how we are reading them and understanding them and kind of how we are critically engaging with them. I think that it's also been a part of a larger kind of idea of um, branding culture as culture in terms of politics. So to go from you know Sarah Binney Weiser's uh, book, Authentic when she talks about that the realms of culture and society once considered outside the official economy, like politics are harnessed, reshaped and made legible in economic terms. And so we see this real kind of um, bringing together and rewriting, um, reshaping of politics in these economic terms, which is not to say that they haven't been in the past, but within these specific economic terms of a platform economy of these gigs of common economies right of these social media economies and so i think that's another thing that is really being shaped is how um, politics kind of are being made legible in economic terms wherein the economic terms are within these social media economies i just want to ask before we move on if anyone else has a comment on that i know uh, regina you mentioned earlier you know the idea of a blackout which would cost which would cost some social media companies money but maybe uh, it would be to the benefit of democracy 
Yeah, I mean, I'll just say quickly that it's quite common um, in other countries that sometimes there's a news blackout or other types of blackouts in the lead up to an election. Um, sometimes this is a tool that can be used when, uh, I mean, I've also actually done election observing for the OAS before. And so, you know, sometimes if you, if there's a reason to believe that there is going to be a great deal of confusion, misinformation, um, potential incitement of violence after an election. Um, you know, traditional media channels might agree to or have imposed upon them um, a blackout on you know reporting of results for a certain period of time. Um, and you know, if we look at the current election through you know a bit different lens, um, if we don't view it as simply the repeat of um, you know, something that's happened every four years in the US, but if we think of it as um, an event that has the potential to generate um, significant conflict and, um, you know, potentially violence, then I think that there's a justification. I mean, I think this, the idea of a social media blackout should be on the table. Um, you know, and I think part of the problem is also, uh, just getting back to some of Jamie's comments, that, you know, when, when, non-factual information is shared. Uh, I mean, we know from research in both political science and in psychology that um, simply seeing information or seeing um, sort of a perspective or a statement repeatedly, even if the reader knows that it is not factually true, um, it changes their perceptions. Um, I mean, so there's something called the illusory truth effect, um, where even when people are told this information is not true, and then a statement is shown to them repeatedly, um, they are more likely to agree that it's true in the future. Um, it's really remarkable. And, uh, you know, in experiments that I've done, and particularly other research that other people have done about um, sort of combating misinformation and rumors, um, I mean, we know that even if, um, that if, if denial of a rumor or a piece of misinformation involves restating the basic statement itself again, or as Jamie is suggesting, drawing additional attention to the statement, um, it often has the opposite effect of what's intended um, of simply actually reinforcing um, belief or the spread of the information. So that's why simply, um, you know, limiting the spread of some of that information is probably the most effective, but we know that social media companies have a hard time filtering through things in real time. So that's why I'd say, you know, why not? Why are they not willing to say democracy is more import important than our bottom line, at least for 24 hours, um, and silence themselves, put themselves on mute for 24 hours, um, and let credible news organizations, you know, disseminate this critical information about the election? I think just to, just to respond to that, um, one of the things that we found in our research, um, as have many others, is that it's less about whether or not it is or isn't factual, but if it feels true, right? If it has those characteristics of, um, which is why uh, one of our projects of the research, we've kind of shifted the conversation from verification to authenticity, where it's if it feels authentic, if it feels true, right? Not so much if it is. Right? And so I think that um, something, at least in academia, that we need to do is kind of shift our conversation to that rather, rather than, and kind of inform journalists as well and kind of bring them into the mix when we talk about these things, about whether or not um, they feel true. The other thing about a social media blackout is, it does seem like a nice idea, uh, but one, it's just the, the, the vast number of uh, mediums <laughs> that are being communicated on, right? If we're thinking, are we gonna get Reddit involved in this, right? Because a lot of the times, a lot of communication happens. 4chan, all of these different um, social media companies, it's just, there's new apps every day. There's new platforms every day, right? And so I think that realistically, Right? It's not necessarily going to happen, especially since there's often a um, circulation across, there's movements kind of across uh, different platforms, especially when something like deplatforming occurs where a certain person's YouTube channel is shut down, but then they might go to Twitch, right? So there's all of these kind of different uh, interactions between the different sites, especially um, a lot of them are kind of closed uh, kind of communities or, or smaller communities that know how to manipulate and know how to move around these different flows of information. So I think that's, that's one of the, the things that might be problematic about something like a media blackout. Secondly, given the state of conspiracy theories right now, the more you kind of, uh, part of it draws from uh, you know, psycho psychoanalysis, um, kind of some of Lacan's work on paranoia, where it's um, not, it's not necessarily that they think 
uh, that they're worried or skeptical, but it's that they accept everything as true, right? Um, and, and in that way, he makes the kind of association that uh, knowledge has a paranoic kind of structure or knowledge is paranoia. And so I think that that uh, is something to bring into account as well, is accepting everything is true. So if there is a blackout, right, if there's something unexplainable, then the, then the other explanations that come up, say conspiracy theories, right, will be accepted as true. And so I think it's something to, to consider as well. If I could just say, so I, I think it's really fascinating to bring in um, insights about how social media can reshape things. It's interesting to think about internet communities as um, consequence-free communities where oftentimes the most sort of like vicious or sociopathic expressions can be can be made with very few consequences uh, um, as opposed to more traditional forms of social interaction where you have to sort of own up to some uh, statements that you made. But I just want to sort of point out that um, part of the reason that, that the United States is in this situation is that a lot of the, the sort of um, uh, basic elements of constitutional government, which may be may seem more accurate than democracy, are really old and informal in the United States. So for example, there are 10,500 jurisdictions that are in charge in various ways of overseeing elections and of counting votes and of canvassing votes and then of certifying votes. That's a lot. And they don't have, they have at most state level oversight of those processes. This is, um, has complicated roots. One could say from an American political standpoint that that speaks to the, gra the long grassroots agreed upon nature of American politics and democratic politics. But whatever the roots are, the point is that the United States now, in comparison to most of its sort of countries that it considers to be its peer countries, although perhaps uh, actually in many ways Brazil, I think is a really fascinating comparison, its democratic protocols, institutions are old and rickety and extremely vulnerable to social media um, manipulation, to voter intimidation in various ways, to voter repression uh, in various forms, in ways that I don't think are as uh, problematic in most Western constitutional or democratic states. Um, and that's really quite a, it's quite remarkable once you start to look under the hood about even such basic things as how do you know who the electors are who are supposed to meet on December 14th for the real vote for president to say who's actually gonna be the president? It's the constitution says th that the states will decide this. How are they decided? It's, it's actually quite informal. I'm almost tempted to say ad hoc in the nature of its actual decision-making uh, uh, formulations. So that renders the United States, in my opinion, more vulnerable to some of the things we've been talking about um, than other Western democracies where there are, of course, social media and where there are, of course, uh, some of these same sort of new media challenges. I don't want to talk too much, but just, just to note on that is that these social media companies, these platforms are built upon those democratic institutions that are outdated, right? A lot of them draw um, their values, say uh, Facebook's corporate values about freedom of expression, right, is one of their core values from language directly lifted from the U.S. Constitution, right? So they are, they are not only um, interacting with these democratic institutions, but they're actually built upon them as well. Right, a really um, fascinating and alarming conversation thus far, but we are going to interrupt it briefly um, for our first poll question. So Sonia, if you wouldn't mind um, putting up that first question. Audience, we want to know what you think is the most pressing issue in this election. COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, race relations, the economy, or partisan polarization. So let's give a moment for everyone to weigh in. This is cool, you can see the results coming in live. Something we won't enjoy on Tuesday night. Okay, take a few more seconds to vote if you haven't already. It looks 
like a fairly even split COVID-19 pandemic is first past the post year, but um, race relations also a very pressing issue. Okay, so panel, do you want to weigh in on either the results of this poll, this question, or you can also reject the premise of the question and say, actually, all these things are related and it's not a very good question. So we'll, we'll leave it up to you if you have something to say. I, I did um, just wanted to, to note that um, I think that in, uh, in presidential elections like this, one precedent that is clear is a um, severely botched or, or objectively bad result that has happened during a presidency that, that moves the needle in the ways that needles are moved in the United States, like five, 10 point shifts in, in um, middle of the road voters. 2006 has happened because the Iraq war, the second Iraq war, was such a disaster that it actually shifted, you know, fairly dramatically um, votes away from the Republican Party. COVID is the same thing. Uh, I, I think that is just borne out by polling um, that is high quality and consistent throughout 2020. Uh, I might note also that um, there is some possibility, and this would go to the point about the possibility, uh, which I think is a small possibility, but still a possibility of a Biden blowout, that would lead through places like Texas. The largest county in Texas, Harris County, um, has voted massively already, overwhelmingly Democratic. And that is not unrelated to the fact that for much of the summer, the hospitals in Harris County were on deviation status because the ICUs were full of COVID patients grafting for breath. Um, in Wisconsin, where there are four to 5,000 new cases per day in a state of 5.8 million, and the hospital systems near Green Bay are near to I won't say collapse, but they're profoundly stressed. That is the issue. And the great majority of voters, um, a considerable majority of voters, even those who are sympathetic to a normally vote conservative or, or, or for Mr. Trump, uh, recognize that and are you know, leaning towards Biden. And then the last point is that just today, um, a very good journalist, Tom Hartman, came out with a piece that was quite explosive. And he noted that for the first three weeks of the pandemic, the Trump administration's response was that of, a, of an administration rather than a regime, that there was some degree of, if not competence, then relatively what other countries were doing. And there was a distinctive shift, as one looks back, in the second week of April, in terms of the speaking about the pandemic, how now we need to get past this, we have to liberate states, open states, a whole quite dramatic and, and sudden shift, not only in discourse, but also in policy when it comes to the distribution, for example, of personal protective equipment. What I wonder could have caused this? Hartman argues that it's an April 7th uh, 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 D-Day in which on April 7th, two of the newspapers of record in the United States, New York Times and Washington Post, both published stories indicating that the death rates, the case mortality rates for COVID in the United States so far were disproportionately and quite shockingly disproportionately for African-Americans, for black people. One sees after this a somewhat dramatic shift uh, towards whatever we're moving on. I don't think they're unrelated. And I think that that is um, a story of stories that links, of course, the issue of COVID to the issues of race relations. And I think that that should not be lost sight of. We normally think of race relations now. I think we're mostly talking about the protests in relation to police uh, brutality and, and, to, and to civil rights uh, uh, issues about voting. But the COVID situation. Um, it should not be surprising at some level that there are these discrepancies, given the much higher rates in the United States uh, for Black Americans of childhood asthma, of type 2, di type two diabetes, uh, of a whole range of respiratory uh, problems that, that are present as comorbidities. Um, so I just wanted to say, I, I think COVID is, is, the, is the needle moving issue of the year. Um, and I think it's the main reason, and not the only one, that Mr. Biden is probably thinking in terms of, or has so many different paths to the requisite 270 electoral votes. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Regina, I think you had a comment? Yeah, so I'll first agree with Jason. Um, and I think that in this poll here, I don't know what people felt when they were voting, um, but I, I do certainly think that um, issues of race and racial inequality and COVID are very much linked um, right now in US politics as they should be, or excuse me, not as they should be, but as they are. It's correct to frame them that way. 
Um, but what I wanted to say also about COVID is that uh, one of the more surprising numbers I'd seen in polling recently was that uh, in some credible polls, Biden was hitting 60% support among Americans over 65, so among seniors. And uh, that was frankly shocking to me. <laughs> um, and it also, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, putting my hat on as an ex-candidate for a moment, um, older people vote. Uh, I mean, the people who turn out in large numbers, um, who are just very, very consistent voters, are older Americans generally. And of course, it's important to increase youth turnout. Um, you know, it's important to reach out to every possible voter, but the people who are certainly going to vote um, are those seniors. And so for someone to hit 60% um, among seniors, to me, that was a very, um, it's a very significant number. And I feel that COVID has to have something to do with that. Um, I mean, it just has to. I don't see another way that he got to those numbers among seniors. Um, so I think that there are potentially, I mean, we'll have to get more data in the future, but there are potentially very direct, concrete ways um, that concern about COVID or dissatisfaction about COVID could be causing that um, five to 10 percentage point shift um, that Jason was referring to. Oh, and maybe I'll just say one other thing really quickly um, when we're thinking about race and COVID um, is also to keep in mind um, Latinx voters in the U.S. and that um, that that community has also been hit extremely hard by COVID um, and in some particularly important states. Um, and that's also, you know, uh, Latinx voters have been increasing in numbers and, um, you know, are increasingly either old enough to vote or registering to vote or turning out to vote. Um, and so I think that that's another block of voters um, that could be important in this election. Yeah, Wendell, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I certainly um, agree with uh, uh, the uh, previous uh, commentaries. Um, and there's clearly some strong uh, links between or among uh, COVID uh, economic uh, situations, um, partisan uh, politics, uh, certainly race relations as well. It was maybe two weeks ago, 14 days ago, uh, when the joint FBI sort of state task force uncovered a plot of uh, white militia in Michigan um, that was planning to kidnap the uh, state governor and basically to subject her to some type of um, a trial for treason of sorts. Um, and certainly we cannot discount the level of, uh, I guess, uh, depravity, paranoia uh, among uh, some of these uh, nationalist uh, militia uh, white organizations in the United States that have been able to operate um, almost without um, serious uh, pushback uh, from state and federal authorities, um, partly because uh, after 2001, the United States uh, federal government um, turned its sights from the Timothy McVeighs and other uh, white nationalists who are uh, incredibly um, well armed, um, who are uh, well funded as well, um, to pursue uh, this endless war in the Middle East, right? And so uh, to your question as well, Melissa, in terms of uh, this climate of civil war, um, and sometimes historians might invoke this language of civil strife and civil war. It's not hyperbolic. When we understand sort of the antecedents of these racial fault lines, these class fault lines in the United States, the ongoing uh, kleptocracy, the rapacious sort of corporate state, um, the hollowing out of uh, U.S. cities, especially post-industrial cities from Cleveland to Detroit to Racine, Washington, to Baltimore, to Chicago, you name it. Um, and the, uh, the sheer suffering, mostly of, of African Americans, of Black people in these urban, um, urban uh, centers, but also of a white working class, which expresses its anxiety and its economic frustrations, uh, not by, of course, aligning with Black people and non-white peoples, but of course, engaging in sort of white supremacist uh, types of behavior. And, and certainly terrorism, domestic terrorism is a part of that. And so we have 
we're entering new grounds and certainly I'm not going to attribute it to the president, although his rhetoric is always dangerous. It's buffoonish. Um, it is very uh, highly charged, um, but we do see sort of a, a coming together of various uh, forces uh, and certainly the partisanship, uh, the partisan politics uh, plays an important role. Um, the hollowing out of the industrial base in the United States, which has been happening, well, I sort of went on a, uh, a significant run during uh, Bill Clinton's presidency uh, with NAFTA. Um, it's something that has been happening since, uh, you know, World War II uh, and sort of capital flight, et cetera, et cetera. And so with all of these forces coming together, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if we do, if the federal government and state authorities do uncover other plots, because these militias are not playing. They're heavily, heavily armed in ways that the general public has not a clue. And frankly, the corporate media is not going to tell us because they don't want to make us paranoid but they have serious artillery that you would ask yourself, how do private citizens, how can you justify having this type of artillery? Well, I guess maybe there's an element of uh, the second amendment that says, this is your God-given right. But of course there's a blank asterisk that we can't see. This is your God-given right, your natural inalienable right, if you're a white man in the United States and you want to check government or state tyranny. Can I say one more point about um, about COVID and, and and Trump? I actually was really thought was really wondering how that was going to go when Mr. Trump himself contracted COVID, um, and I thought that was a really fascinating moment where he, you know, there was there was the airlift, then he came back to the White House, and there was the removal of the mask, and I, I was really wondering how this was going to go and how this was going to play. Um, and as many of the panelists have pointed out, American people, American voters don't have the best record of voting um, against or, or, or of sort of uh, making multiracial uh, 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 um, interest voting. That is, they often have picked, to be put it very, very bluntly, race over class. However, there is one type of privilege that Americans, pretty much of all stripes, can agree on that they really detest, which is really visible, gaudy privileges that political figures have. The populism in the United States has this really strong anger at people who are politically who are in political office rather than those who are super rich mr trump obviously benefited from that when he came into office but when he was airlifted on marine one to walter reed surrounded by an army of uh, doctors some of whom clearly were not uh, being entirely forthright and then pumped full of uh, experimental drugs and brought back that did not that was not a good look when it comes to um, just then speaking an entirely superficial political advertising type uh, of view, historically Americans really hate that. They really hate political privilege. And that's why it plays so well to talk about corruption, right? Um, and so that really did not seem to help Mr. Trump. Um, and just, you know, as a general point, most world leaders, to a lesser extent, uh, Justin Trudeau, to a lesser extent, uh, Emmanuel Macron, but still more than the US, get a bump from this, from a pandemic, because they, you know, they basically just have, they basically try to stay calm, essentially channel what the public health experts say, and that's pretty much it. So to not get a bump, which Mr. Trump has not, indicates again that this is the, this is the issue that would have taken what otherwise would have been a very closely run election, with Biden barely ahead, to a, what in the United States is a significant lead. Uh, whether that will hold up, I don't know, but I am pretty sure that that's because of COVID. It's because of the objectively terrible handling of it, and it's even because of Mr. Trump's own experience with it. Okay, so um, another question we got from an audience member, this is uh, Noah from McGill University. He was asking about the issue of foreign policy and certainly people across the world will be watching what happens on Tuesday and then also maybe in the days and weeks, maybe months thereafter while we, you know, wait the results. Um, and, you know, we are all speaking together and meeting together. We're in Canada. The election outcome matters greatly for Canadians. 
So a question I'd love to open up to the group uh, is what in particular you think is at stake in this election for Canada, whether it's, you know, Canadian politics, Canadian culture, uh, take the question however as you'd like to, to go with it, but uh, that's something that I'd love us to talk about. Is anyone going or? <laughs> I think you can, if you want to go first, I was just going to say, maybe I stumped all of you. <laughs> um, so if I may take a stab at it, there's been a long history of uh, Canadians in general um, truly being enamored with uh, the United States and US politics and the various conflagrations, um, the violence, the spectacle of the US racial order. Um, it's always occupied a, a significant place in the Canadian imagination. Um, so certainly I'm, I'm not surprised that so many in Canada um, are concerned about what's happening in the United States, uh, con uh, especially in light of the uh, various uh, points of um, connection, the cross-pollination, trade, um, certainly uh, one of our closest uh, military allies, one of our closest uh, NATO allies, uh, you know, one of our closest uh, trading partners, uh, there's clearly um, an impact that uh, the election will have on, on Canadian institutions and our governments and our peoples. Um, but that said, there's also the sort of unvarnished reality that the Republican Party, the GOP, and the Democratic Party are both neoliberal entities. They both serve the interests of a corporatist movement in the United States that has been only gaining greater traction after the 2007-2008 financial meltdown. Uh, and in terms of the nuts and bolts of this neoliberal order, not much is going to change, whether it's Donald Trump as a figurehead, because the president, the presidency is merely a figurehead. The president does now wield some spectacular powers. The institution of the presidency is where the power lies. And of course, the institution is inextricably linked to the military industrial complex. It is inextricably linked to Wall Street. It is inextricably linked to big oil. It is inextricably linked to the imperial wars overseas. So whether it's Donald Trump, who is the president, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Mike Pence, the sort of hawkish, imperialistic uh, foreign policy will persist. Um, and whomever is the prime minister of Canada certainly will have to navigate that. And Donald Trump poses a lot of challenges because he is just so uncouth. He is unpredictable. He is an iconoclast. But let's not, be let's not be mistaken, Donald Trump and Joe Biden have way more in common than they do in their differences. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party have way more in common than they do in terms of their, than they do differences. The real issue is that the absence of a critical class analysis in terms of what's been happening to the majority of US citizens, most of whom, of course, are racialized, many of whom are black, many of whom are confined and stuck in these post-industrial cities that are like war zones. If you've ever been to Baltimore, ever been to parts of New Haven, ever been to Detroit or Racine, uh, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the real issue is. And that's where if we want to see uh, elements of US uh, foreign policy or US uh, national and domestic policy taking a positive step, some of these critical race and critical class analyses must take place. Otherwise, it's just all empty rhetoric and we're just playing the performance of uh, electoral uh, politics. So uh, coming at it from a media studies perspective, it may not perhaps be what's at stake, but what could and potentially will be impacted 
is thinking about how the Canadian government going forward will deal with electoral um, integrity online, their, their policies towards online uh, free speech um, or restriction of that free speech, uh, and questions around the Canadian criminal code. So one of the kind of major differences uh, in the US and Canada relies on the kind of US constitutional focus on the individual and the individual's rights. And in Canada, in our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, well, there are you know, provisions about the individual. There's also a whole section, section 27, about multiculturalism, right? And that kind of fundamental tension between multiculturalism and individualism, right? That exists when we are bringing in platforms and media and we're using it every day uh, that are fundamentally rooted in kind of a US neoliberal um, type of logic, which is not to say that there's not neo neoliberal here, but kind of that liberalism type of individualistic um, logic, right, that it's built upon right, is, is, is at times um, in friction, right, uh, with Canadian multicultural as outlined by, uh, you know, kind of our uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So I think that's something moving forward. I know in 2019, the Canadian government uh, made a declaration on electoral integrity online. They uh, launched several efforts um, to kind of intensify how they were combating disinformation. Although I don't actually know how successful it was, uh, but it's kind of this larger uh, tension between those two. And so far, it's been really difficult to kind of regulate online speech and online conversation when it turns abusive and hateful. One thing that the Canadian government did uh, a few years ago was um, change part of, I believe it was Section 13 of the uh, Canadian Communications Act uh, to include uh, provisions about hate speech online and, and regulation of it. And it was very unpopular and launched several uh, countersuits and was actually taken away a year later, right? Because um, it was so controversial, because it was so challenged. Um, and that's one of those ones where the, uh, the, the Crown was arguing in favor of this regulation because it was about preserving this kind of Canadian rights, uh, Charter of Rights and Freedom, um, Section 27, about multiculturalism, about the, the rights of our society Right, versus the rights of the individual. Um, and so that's one thing I'm going to be, uh, I'm interested to see, um, or perhaps worried. <laughs> um, I think that this is something we're really going to need to consider and have critical engagement with going forward because it can affect things, uh, say, as the, uh, the, uh, the criminal code, right, where there are laws in place for harassment, which, and there were, there are now uh, some, there is now one for harassment online, which is specific to the circulation of images against someone's consent. But there's, there's a potential impact there that could be changing major legislation in Canada if you know, that friction is, or rather within the environment of that friction. Um, if I understand one thing, I think it's not exactly foreign policy, but one clear divide both actual and perceived between the United States and, and Canada in terms of their societies is, of course, the issue of health care. Um, and I think while I agree largely with, with Wendell's analysis about the, the nature of the parties um, and their kind of the way they approach economic and social questions, the, new, the difference between the, their ideas about health care is, I think, a little bit more significant and would be significant for Canadians to see and react to. So for example, should Mr. Trump pull off a, a victory, which he has a, a chance to do, he basically has to redo his 2016 map. I don't see any other way for him to win. Um, if he were to do that, I am fairly certain, and it might even be otherwise, that a lawsuit currently in, uh, seeking a standing in the, at the Supreme Court will undo or, or will get rid of what remains of the Affordable Care Act, which has already been significantly weakened uh, over the past four years. It's a, it's a suit brought by 18 different um, attorneys general uh, led by one from Texas. Um, if that were to happen and if Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act was to be entirely uh, abolished, the differences would be more stark. There, there, there would be more persons in the United States who are unemployed fairly quickly. Estimates range up to 22 million. Um, you know, it would be a more dramatic difference uh, in, in terms of the way they approach 
some of the most basic um, questions of modern society, which is, are you going to offer a basic level or, of care or not? Um, if Mr. Biden prevails, then I suspect that there would be, there will still be that fight with the courts, but most likely there'd be an effort to recreate or to re or to strengthen or to, to at least um, sustain the Affordable Care Act, which just is, is, a, is a difference of degree, uh, um, both with the Canadian uh, model or the provincial models in, in Canada and with the um, likely Republican alternative. Oh, and just one thing I forgot to mention uh, is that uh, in the States, um, with the upcoming election, uh, positions such as like the FCC chairman, right, are appointed by the president and I believe approved by the Senate uh, through confirmation. Uh, so essentially, the person who's in charge of the FCC, right, is the person who is responsible for re regulating major telecom companies, which may possibly include uh, social media platforms such as Facebook. Uh, Twitter, YouTube, Google, etc. So the potential appointee for the FCC, uh, for, the, for the policies that the FCC will put out, right, those are also going to be very much dependent on who is the next uh, president, as well as any changes in power in terms of Congress and the Senate. Uh, maybe I'll just jump in quickly at this point. I kind of wanted to defer to actual Canadians um, to comment on how the election was going to affect Canada. Um, but I guess on the foreign policy side, um, you know, there's, there's much to agree with in what Wendell said. Um, but one point of disagreement that I would have is that there has been this hollowing out of um, professional for career foreign service officers, career civil servants, um, you know, people with a great deal of knowledge um, who should have been senior administrators in all sorts of different government agencies throughout the Trump administration. I mean, a lot of them have just fled or have been forced out. And so I think that with a Biden presidency, um, you know, there would be at minimum um, not any further hollowing out um, of the civil service and of the you know sort of foreign policy apparatus um, of the United States. And to the contrary, I mean, I think a Biden administration would bring back in um, a lot of the sort of like establishment democratic foreign policy types. Um, you may view that as a bad thing if you're not a fan of the democratic foreign policy establishment either. Um, but at minimum, there would be someone in those key offices who would answer the phone, uh, you know, if the Canadian government called and there would be somebody there literally doing their job, staffing these agencies, um, acting in a professionalized and predictable way. So I have to believe that um, a Biden administration would be probably easier to deal with and easier to negotiate with um, than a Trump administration going forward. And, uh, you know, just as an American kind of temporarily living in Canada, um, I'll say that you know, the border closure um, has been quite something. And, you know, people sometimes ask me, like friends and relatives in the US, so when do you think it'll actually end? And uh, my standard answer, my guess, is like six months into a Biden presidency. Um, I mean, I just think that if, you know, to see some reasonable level of, um, you know, sort of good governance and a, a sort of a good government um, best efforts approach to controlling COVID, you know, I think it would take several months um, of, a new administration. And then maybe there would be some hope of, um, you know, kind of normalizing the border relationship again, which seems like it must be critically important. Um, it's, it's important to me personally, but I would think it has to be important to a lot of other people in Canada as well. Yeah, Wendell, go ahead. I certainly agree with uh, Gina's point in terms of this flight of talent from uh, the State Department and other important um, federal departments uh, and the U.S. Uh, government. Um, but where the State Department is concerned, um, I mean, we should ask ourselves this question, right? If the State Department uh, does support the efforts of uh, the Pentagon and U.S. imperialism overseas, how do we reconcile these challenges? How do we reconcile these sort of uncomfortable truths, right? Um, and of course, I'm not in any way saying I'm a proponent of talented individuals, talented, competent individuals working in these very important roles overseas. 
Um, but we do need to have a conversation in terms of what it means if the State Department ultimately um, is servicing uh, a very imperialistic, hawkish foreign policy. What one wonders too, if I could just jump in that, that uh, if one looks carefully at the distinctions between Mr. Trump and his rivals in 2016 on the Republican side, and just compares and don't, don't worry about the style or the form of address, uh, just, you know, what, what, what are the policy differences? They're very, they actually very, very similar slash taxes, slash regulations, um, appoint, you know, hard right judges, uh, you know, straight up. And, and they're actually quite similar. The ways that, that Mr. Trump uh, deviated from his Republican rivals um, in 2016 in terms of policy, I guess it's twofold. He would talk about a kind of a protectionist idea it's to protect the companies, not the workers, but it, it, it did kind of get this resonance and did move the needle a little bit among, interestingly, male men uh, in union households are deeply divided, often within the houses themselves. There was a considerable movement among union, uh, uh, male union members voting for, for Mr. Trump in some key states. That, that, that phenomenon is overblown, but it did happen um, you know, empirically as a response to some, at least some, some gesture to fury at the neoliberal order. Uh, otherwise, he's a neoliberal in every other way, and often quite militant one. The other way he differed, though, is he would make these, these, these attacks about American interventionism, not as critiquing American imperialism, but rather as saying, we're sick of save, self, solving everyone else's problems. That's how he framed it. But that resonated. And a large number of white voters in Mr. Trump's coalition's white coalition, I mean, there's no other way to put it, um, like that. And that, that was a point that was really interesting in the debates. I recall him, uh, you know, in, as well as insulting uh, uh, Jeff Bush um, as being low energy, which is a, a, a thing that's just stuck on, on Jeff Bush. Also, you know, your, your brother ruined this. We, we, all these Americans are dead. Again, not saying we shouldn't have a, 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 um, opposing an imperialistic dimension of the United States. No, uh, we're, we're sick of uh, cleaning up everyone's problems. Now, of course, that's a ridiculous statement. The problem didn't happen until we invaded, but or the, the, the problems became much greater after we invaded. But the, the point is, there was that isolationist dimension of Trump, even if only rhetorical. Um, although I think he has actually some of those instincts that resonated uh, in 2016. Um, yeah, if I could just jump in for a second, I think one other difference. I guess now we're getting back to 2016 instead of 2020, but um, you know, trying to think back to the Republican primary and who the contenders were, um, I mean, I think you've, you're right about the isolationism, um, but also the xenophobia, and I mean, the open embrace of um, white supremacy. Uh, I mean, this is someone who started his uh, presidential campaign by calling Mexicans, you know, rapists and murderers, and it only got worse from there. Um, and you know, so things that I really struggle to see another Republican president having done in the last few years include, and but are not limited to, um, the Muslim ban, uh, the drastic um, mistreatment of asylum seekers in the U.S., uh, the, pam the policy of family separation. I mean, just the open embrace of um, racially inflammatory rhetoric, um, the public flirtation with white supremacist groups. Um, you know, I think that to me, those um, behaviors are things that I just, I cannot envision um, President Marco Rubio or President Jeb Bush having done. And, you know, and they've really contributed, um, you know, to the uh, sort of erosion of democratic norms, um, to the uh, kind of, you know, rise of extremist language, um, but also to the flight of, you know, getting back to the professional civil service and the foreign service officers. I mean, you know, to really pushing people like that out of government and making them feel like, uh, you know, maybe they agreed in the beginning that they could serve any Republican president and any Democratic president, um, but that this is just not what they signed up for. Um, and so, you know, speaking uh, just of some of my ex-colleagues and things. I mean, I think that the Muslim ban in particular made it very difficult for some people to stay in the foreign service and have that uh, be consistent with their values. Can I ask though that, is it that you can't see these other presidents uh, doing it or that they, you can't see these other presidents enacting some of those uh, actions in public? Because I think that's a different question, right? Is that these are being done in a very public manner, um, but as we've seen in the past, there are often um, behind the scenes, uh, different or kind of 
inferred uh, ways in which kind of xenophobia has been included in uh, legislation. Um, and so I think that it's, it's more so that it's in, more so that it's visible rather than different per se. And I'm, I'm also asking from someone from a communications and media background. So, um, so I, I, I look to your expertise. That's an excellent point slash question, uh, Jamie. And part of the frustration that I'm experiencing and part of the frustration that many of my loved ones in the States um, are experiencing is that when they look at Biden's platform and Donald Trump and the GOP and what they stand for, once you get through the sort of the facade and the performance of civility, and of course there is little of that on the right, um, the policies, the policies where it comes to uh, mass incarceration, deindustrialization, um, just the outright genuflecting at the feet of Wall Street, right, and the most rapacious of capitalists, those traits, those characteristics do not differ much in terms of Trump or Biden. And this is where we really need to push the agenda forward in terms of um, restoring something that has been lost in terms of working class people and middle class peoples in the United States. Because where we're headed right now is very bleak, not simply because of white supremacists, but because of the entire sort of working class that has been hollowed out, has been completely just gutted. And we're headed to a place where in another four years, we will have somebody if possible in another four years or eight years, we'll have somebody who is actually pedigreed and wickedly smart and knows policy like the back of their hand. And there are a few of them in the GOP camp. I'm not going to name their names, okay? Donald Trump is a harbinger, but when said individuals come and they do take up the presidency, civil war or some serious type of strife will kick off because I don't know how long you can tell poor people wait four more years, wait four more years, performative politics, look at my shoes as the VP, or look at how groovy and fly, I, all of that means nothing. If I'm a father in post-industrial USA, my sons have been incarcerated because they were smoking dope when white boys smoke dope and they get rehab, like Biden's son, while he has literally warehoused hundreds of thousands of young black men, I cannot in good faith ever turn my back on where I came from as a poor black man in North America. Simply because somebody speaks with civility, that means nothing to me. I would rather know you're white supremacist. I would rather know that your policies will go, are going to harm my family and I, as opposed to pretending that civility will save me and my peoples. There's a, yet another, um, you know, sort of fissure that I think is, is not much discussed, which is, um, so I think as this as this plays out and we get close to election day here, and Mr. Trump has been unable, for various reasons, but mostly because of COVID, to narrow the gap which he would need to do to pull out a victory or dispute a victory. Um, as that has happened, um, you get this sort of uh, rhetoric of threat of you know we might not accept the election. Um, the Proud Boys are are standing back and standing by. Okay, but I'm looking at the, the, the uh, you know, qu quite well done polls for a long time now in New York and California and New England states. Uh, with the exception of Wyoming, which is 30 points favoring Trump, all of those states, New York, New York on East and California, which make up about a quarter of America's population and more of that than its wealth, oppose Mr. Trump by 35 to 40 points, which is unprecedented. I mean, th th those states are normally not on the losing side of things. I really am not sure at some point um, that there isn't the, you know, it's not so much like, wow, will, will uh, the Proud Boys accept the election if Trump loses? Will the blue states accept the election if, if Trump wins? I, I actually wonder about that at some level. Um, during the COVID crisis, some of these governors began to coordinate just by themselves, which is unusual. Usually you have a federal effort or a state uh, effort. I, I could imagine more of that happening um, in the event of a Trump victory. Um, 
because the divides are so powerful and they they're they're they crisscross the divides that, that Wendell's talking about and they're uh, and they're um, but they're real they, they, and the the, the 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 degree to which um, Trump is held in contempt uh, as just morally impossible in a huge swath of these very powerful and wealthy states is something to think about. Uh, it really is. And, it, and it's, um, it just calls to mind the, the, the sort of fragility of the American national project to, w with all its limitations of the American sort of uh, 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 union uh, as a union. It is uh, um, dicey now. It, it is in question in a way that I, I have not seen uh, or have not uh, imagined uh, for a long time. I'm gonna jump in because we are out of time and we wanted to end actually on this question of what's next for the United States. I think you guys all touched on it. I think there is another hour and a half of conversation we could have. So maybe, you know, we need to get all of you back after the election once we know the outcome. But um, we wanna thank all of our panelists for their time and for sharing your thoughts with us today. We, I learned a lot. Uh, I know I'm sure many others did as well. Uh, I wanna thank as well the JHI and especially to Sonia Johnson for all her help. And I wanna thank all the people who tuned in and sent us their questions. I know we are all spending a lot of time online and on Zoom. And so uh, we're very grateful for those of you who did log back on today, maybe after your work shift ended or whatnot, that you logged on to spend this time with us. So thank you. Yeah, as Melissa said, we definitely um, learned a lot, but we of course still do not know what's going to happen on Tuesday and beyond. Uh, we know the next few days will matter a lot, so please, if you have American friends and family, please be in touch with them. Make sure they vote if they haven't voted already. So thanks again to our panelists and to all of you for tuning in, and uh, stay well, everybody.